Now, that brings us down to verse 7 here. And when we come to verse 7, we have come to the second danger signal. There is here the peril of doubting. And we need to consider this very carefully because, again, when we consider the ones to whom it was written and the circumstances, I think it'll be very meaningful for us today. Now, will you notice he concluded this section by saying, "...but Christ as a son over his own house." He's a son. He's the creator. He's not a creature, and he is not a servant. He is the son of God. And whose house are we? We belong to this house today, the body of believers, the family of God, the household of faith. And he says, since we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing and the hope firm unto the end. Now, the proof that you're a child of God is to God. He knows your heart. He knows whether you're saved today or not. But if you're a child of God, you're going to be rejoicing in the hope firm unto the end, since you hold fast. And that's the reason today you can't tell whether a lot of the folk that are in our churches are saved or not. They sure don't act like it. Some of them look like and act like they've been weaned on a dill pickle. They're not very joyful about things. Now, at verse 7 here, we come, therefore, to this second danger signal. And I tell you, he's taken us to the heights, and we want to beware. We want to note this. He says, wherefore. Now, We've got another wherefore here. This is a chapter full of wherefores. It opens with verse 1, wherefore. Verse 7 here is wherefore. And then when you get down to verse 10, we're going to wherefore again. This is a very important word. We said it is a swinging door that swings into the past, swings into the future. It's a danger signal as you come to the great highway that leads to heaven. It says look both ways before you pull out. Some crazy driver may be coming down on the wrong side of the freeway, and you better watch out for him. Wherefore, as the Holy Spirit saith, today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation in the day of testing or temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tested me, proved me, and saw my works." Forty years. Now, we've come here to a very important portion of the Word of God. He says now, wherefore, in view of what he's already said, if the word spoken by Moses and by the prophets was so important, well, what about the word spoken by Jesus? Therefore, we need to be very careful about doubting him. Now, Wherefore, the Holy Spirit saith, Today, today, if you'll hear his voice. Now, this is a quotation from Psalm 95, beginning at verse 7. And let's look at it. Now, we've been over the Psalms, and we've said very definitely that we believe Christ is in every Psalm. I don't say I can find him in every Psalm. You want to know the truth? I can't. But you can sure find him in a great many of them. And this one here is a very important psalm, therefore. Psalm 95, verse 7. For he's our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you'll hear his voice, harden not your heart, as in the provocation, as in the day of testing in the wilderness." When your fathers tested me and proved me and saw my work, forty years long was I grieved with this generation and said, It's a people that do err in their heart, and they have not known my ways, unto whom I swear in my wrath that they should not enter into my rest. Now we have here the interpretation of this particular psalm, Israel is given to us as an example. And I want to spend just a few moments looking at this. They doubted God, and because they doubted God, 
they never entered the land of Canaan. That refers to those that came out of the land of Egypt. Now, this passage closed with the little word, rest. They shall not enter into my rest. And you're going to find, I've marked it in my Bible, I think that there's at least a dozen references in this chapter and the next chapter to the word rest. Now, the word rest in this section here doesn't always mean the same kind of rest. There is the rest of salvation, and we are going to see that. And that's what the Lord Jesus meant when he said, "'Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll rest you.'" That is, he'd lift the burden of sin from you if you'd come to him because he bore it for us on the cross, and our sins are forgiven. We have redemption through his blood. Even the forgiveness of sins, Paul said. And therefore, you don't have to do anything to cause God to forgive you because he's already done that. When Christ died, all you've got to do is accept him. All you have to do is to believe him. Now, these people here knew the rest of redemption. They're no longer slaves in Egypt. They came out by blood, blood on the doorposts. They came out by power. God brought them across the Red Sea. God delivered them. They know what the rest of redemption is now. But the Lord Jesus went on to say, when he talked about to come unto him for rest, he says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly, and you shall find rest for your souls. That's a different kind of rest. Now, that's not the rest of redemption. Actually, I'd call it the rest of of obedience, the rest of the enjoyment of your Christian life. The children of Israel, they came out of the land of Egypt. And when they crossed over, they sang the song of Moses and Jehovah. Jehovah is a man of war. He delivered us. It's great. But now they come up, actually a 12 days journey, they could have gotten in the promised land. But you know what happened? They came up to that land. They sent in spies. That wasn't necessary. God told them, I'll take care of you. Just believe me and go on in. But he yielded to them. If you need a little extra proof, God will give it to you. So he let them send in spies. But these spies, they didn't see the wonderful land. All they saw were giants. And they saw themselves as grasshoppers. But they didn't see God. And they came back and gave them a false report, except Caleb and Joshua. And they said, we can take the land. Old Caleb said, we'll be able to take care of those giants. So that these people sent in spies, and they wasted 40 days until the spies came back. And then they wouldn't accept Joshua and Caleb. They took the report of the majority of the committee. And that's my reason for believing that committees are not satisfactory to do the Lord's work. And therefore, they went into the wilderness. And for every day those spies were in the land, they spent a year in the wilderness, 40 years they spent in the wilderness. Now, the point is this. They didn't believe God enough to enter into the land. They believed enough to come out of Egypt, but not enough to enter into the land. What did they need to do? Well, God says this generation that put up the excuse of their children, they're not going to enter. Their bones are going to lie out here in this wilderness. That's where they're going to be buried. But I'm going to bring their children into the land. So we'll find out later on Joshua brought them into the land of Canaan. And how did he do it? Well, he sent the ark down ahead. Christ has gone ahead of us down to the Jordan River. They're going to cross now another body of water. And it's a flood state. And so the ark is brought down by the priests. The people are far off. And then the waters of the Jordan were cut off right there, way back up, all the way to Adam. I don't think that's the name of place. I think that's the name of the first man that sinned. All the way back. Then they took 12 stones out of the river where these men stood and put them over on the other shore where they were going on the side of the promised land. Then they took 12 stones from over there 
and they put them down in the Jordan River. Now, those 12 stones in the Jordan River, when that water went back over, that speaks of the death of Christ. Those stones taken out of the river and put on the other side as a monument speaks of the resurrection of Christ. Friends, you and I never enter into that Canaan rest of obedience to God and of enjoying the fruits of the Christian life until we enter in through the death and resurrection of Christ. And that's what Paul meant in Romans when he begins to talk about we are buried with him in baptism, raised with him in newness of life. We're now joined to a living Christ. And that's the only way we're going to enjoy Canaan. Now, Canaan's not heaven. We're going to find out that there's an eternal rest. And Jesus gives that rest. But today, the question is, have you entered into the rest that believers are to have? Are you a rejoicing Christian today? Well, you'll find out that the only way to do it is to come to the Word of God, is to believe the Word of God and study the Word of God. How many Christians, how many church members today really study the Word of God? Well, my friends, we're going to be told in this passage of Scripture that the Word of God is quick and powerful. Now, that primarily refers to the Lord Jesus. It refers to the written Word, too. Therefore, the only way you and I can stay close to Him is to stay close to the Word of God. And the only way that you and I can enjoy the grapes of Eschol and the fruits of the land and the beauty of it and the enjoyment of it is by studying the Word of God. That's the reason we're spending time in the Word of God. And the reason I read letters from people that say for the first time they found out what the joy of the Lord is. Being a Christian's been like a yoke on them. Being a church member, all they know about is they are browbeaten to give money and to do certain things, or the Lord will be terribly displeased with them, and everything is a duty instead of being drawn to the person of Christ. Now, he says here, therefore, today, if you'll hear his voice, before it's too late, Christian friend, start enjoying. 